105 degrees, like you know, in a in water bath, and 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 really get it to thaw out quickly over like 15 minutes, and then put it back in the refrigerator so it doesn't thaw out over a long time. If you thaw it over a long time, it starts to ferment. It starts to get sour. If you thaw it out quickly, remember bacteria counts double every 20 to 22 minutes in raw milk. Those are not bad bacteria. Those are the good probiotic bacteria that are growing. Bad bacteria, I guess, can grow that fast too. But when you have rapid growth of good bacteria, the bad bacteria are outcompeted. They're the lesser form. There's always a ratio of good versus bad in your intestine, and the good always knock out the bad and suppress it. When you take antibiotics, guess what? The background flora get knocked out, and the bad get to take off. That's what's so tough about antibiotics. Antibiotics are not bad, but they're a dangerous tool that should be used very carefully with very, very specific knowledge about what you're trying to kill and why. They should not be used as preventative or you know whatever. They're a very, very, very dangerous tool that have um, serious issues. So, yes? The industry kind of, I haven't read about it in a long time, but the dirty secret of, we always hear pasteurization, right. but the next level up, because pasteurization isn't really doing the job. Right. Will you talk to that? UHT. There are one, two, three, four levels of pasteurization that I can think of. That pasteurization, which is 140 degrees for about 30 minutes, which is the least damaging of all the pasteurization processes, and it's been used broadly for cheeses forever. It's a vat of milk that's heated up over a 30 minute period and then cooled down. Um, that knocks out the enzymes of the bacteria just like the next temperature, which is 161 degrees for 15 to 20 seconds. That's called HTST, high temperature, short time. In other words, it's a flash. 15 seconds, it's taken up real high, 160 degrees, and then back down cool. So it limits its exposure to the high heat. And that kills off the enzymes as well as the bacteria as well. However, the, lo the, the, higher, the, back the higher the milk temperature you can get, the longer the shelf life you'll get because the deader it is. So the next temperature step is 282 degrees for two to five seconds, and that's where you take it to HTST, and then you inject culinary steam into it and spikes it up really, really hot, way above boiling for just a couple seconds, and that's called UHT, or Ultra High Temperature Pasteurization, or UP, which is, it's, which is ultra pasteurization. Now, you can get it so hot and so clean and so sterile with the packaging that, in fact, you can have it sit in your garage next to your paint thinner. <laughs> it's like in Europe, the little brick milk that's unrefrigerated. UP, it tastes like heck, yeah, it's, it's not milk anymore, it's paint thinner. <laughs> but anyway, so there's different levels of what they do, and the higher you get, the longer the, quote, the fresh shelf life. In fact, it's actually embalmed dead milk. It's dead, yeah. really dead. Um, so there's different levels, and your body, what's your body want to do? Quickly break down things and digest them. If it's super, super dead, it doesn't break down, it's hard to digest. So why would, you know, you have all kinds of lactose intolerance and all kinds of bowel problems and stuff is just not good for your digestive tract or that compost pit that's supposed to break things down quickly. Because it's not, it doesn't break down its long shelf life. It acts the same way in your gut as it does in the shelf. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, I get the emails and things that kind of keep up on what's going on with raw milk. Uh -huh. I get very concerned for you guys, like you guys are going to go out of business. Yeah. Um, and I hear about, you know, when they degrade you and you have to throw out all this milk. What we make cheese, don't worry about it. Okay. Make cheese. That helps. Actually, yeah, I was wondering. We don't drop. We don't lose a drop. We 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 get creative. We don't drip drip a drop. We um, we make cheese. We 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 do what we need to do. Uh, we've got a really sharp team, and we have a long term view on this. Right. We we understand that in 1972, Mr. Earl Butts. I don't know if anybody's heard this speech before from me, but Earl Butts was the Undersecretary of Agriculture from Nixon, and he said, "When you hear the word organic, think starvation." Viva la commercial agriculture. That's what he was saying. Well, in, 19, in 2002, 30 years later, Glickman signed the National Organic Plan, the USDA Organic Standards. So it took 30 years to go from raw milk is communist to raw milk is acceptable. I mean, uh, not raw milk, but uh, organic standards are, you know, Rodale's craziness versus a national organic standard. Now, organics is just an example of dramatic revolution in terms of allowing this to even come to the forefront, USDA even acknowledging it. Well, raw milk's been around for a long time, but it's been politically suppressed. It's now coming out as a truism. And with the advent of the internet, and what we're doing with education, and other people with what Mike Schmidt's doing, and what Fox News has been doing, and they're going to be doing some big stuff, and some other things with the Food Network that they're doing this fall, um, it's, it's, it's manifesting itself as a real food issue. And so we think it's about a 10-year transition because it's going to be speeded up by the internet. So let's say by 2015, you will see the FDA acknowledging it because we'll have a new generation of administrators and there'll be all these people that have grown up in raw milk and be senators that are drinking it and say, hey, back off raw milk, let's have our raw milk. There'll be just a change. But that happened in today's roots. Tonight made a difference. 
It just takes that time. But the internet will play the part. The, the YouTube video that they're doing tonight, all these kinds of things play a part. Your comment will play a part. And it's almost as if the more they stick me in the ribs with a stick and hurt me, the more it hurts you, the more it hurts them. I mean, their biggest mistake is to try to shut us down because that just makes you scream loud and you're going to come up with, I want my raw milk, I don't care what they're going to do. I want a cow share program with their getting pastors there. Get it anyway. And that just riles them. So it would behoove them to be real quiet, keep it real cool, and work with us so that at least the evolution takes a slower period of time and it's more gradual instead of dramatic and radical. Because the word dramatic and radical, you create news because it bleeds, it leads, right? You create news and then people are aware and you every time they bring us up in the news, more people want the, you know, not everybody loves us, but it doesn't matter. One-tenth of one percent is massive for us. So you have 10,000 people, one-tenth of one percent. You've got 35 million people in California. There's only 35,000 people that know about us, right? 40,000. So that's like a fraction of one percent. So little tiny changes are massive changes when it comes to this kind of thing. So I, I would be worried as a consumer, and you express your worry by voting with your dollars, wearing the T-shirt, telling your friends, and building it to something that cannot be messed with because it's too big. It's too big of a grill in the room to try to, to, to put out. Uh, it, it's literally a consumer-based fight. It, it's all about you and me working effectively together to communicate and battle together uh, peacefully to affect change based on truth. It's exciting, too, because you see this evolution. I mean, in, in 2000, this wasn't going on. Now it's going on big time, and it's exciting. With the push towards the whole North American Union and making everybody one happy family, yeah. and Canada being the way that it is, yeah. what, what's in the circles that you travel, what's the, the standard with us becoming the next European Union? Type? It is not a national standard. It is a state-by-state -state standard. Well, I'm saying if we go North American Union. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. I think there's I mean, such a, well, I don't want to talk like a politician here, but I will just a little bit. There's been such a huge backlash of the exportation of jobs right. and the de-employment of Americans that people are saying, ah, uh -uh, I want my job back. I want my right to survive back economically. And that's being extended into food as well, local food, local jobs. Local, and, and so I think you're going to see a manifest change in terms of uh, we, tax incentives for, job, for, for companies to keep their jobs here and build their own electric cars here so we don't have to bring in, uh, you know, uh, petrochemicals from outside and keep our dollars here. So I don't want to become isolationist at all. I want to trade, but I want to also make sure that we have the ability for Americans to feed Americans and fuel Americans, fuel your cars and your gut, you know, all from America and be in concert with nature versus conflict. And so that's why I see it going forward. And that's not communist, that's not Republican, that's not Democrat. That's just a way to survive. That's just reality. Um, and every part of this is going to play a part. I mean, you're going to see a change all, you see a change in commercial agriculture right now. Fewer and fewer pesticides are used. There used to be like 10 different agricultural pesticide uh, crop testing agencies, you know, with companies. Now there's two in Fresno County. There's just no job for them. Nobody wants to spray agrochemicals because nobody wants to buy fruit to break with it. So you see the, the BRICS chemicals of, of, of evolving from where they used to sell a lot of pesticides to now more friendly things and beneficial insects and, and friendly kinds of uh, other things. So there's an evolution going on based on dollars spent. The consumer spends dollars, capitalism follows that consumer. And it doesn't matter whether it was Obama's in president or, or, or Palin McCain's in, uh, in presidency because they don't generally change policy of agencies down underneath them. Food safety doesn't change, dietary, re that, that all comes from the grassroots up. They're gonna change policy on other things, but they don't change like internal FDA policy. That's like goes on multi-administration kind of thing that's kind of standardized. In fact, you look at Clinton, you look at, all, and the administration policies at FDA were very, almost consistent. USDA very consistent. It changed with other paradigm changes. So we want to be that paradigm change that changes that regardless of who's the president. And hopefully we have a president will support us, but we don't know that for sure. Never know. But we'll see the administration's change based on our change by the way we vote our dollars and the way that industry moves with us. And I think that's the big message. It really doesn't matter who's president, although I have my, I'm a big Obama guy, but nonetheless. Um, I believe that he will not change policy within the, the administrations. It will be where the consumers drive dollars and where industry moves and then agencies have to serve industry, which is multi-administration, not one. So that's my, my drive on that. I think it's, I think it's, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Any other thoughts, concerns, thoughts?
taking two hours of you guys' time. Thank you for coming. Well, I'm very happy to be yeah. here. Thank very happy to be here. Much. You're very welcome. Is your chem kombucha, is that made actually with like a, like a, it's a glass. mushroom? Like it's a, a big yeah. little mushroom that's supposed to not be you replace? What we do is we have a we have a five gallon glass container. Right. We fill it with the, the tea. Right. And we put that kombucha, the um, SCOBY, the symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast together in the top, which is like a floating, looks like a mushroom, but it's not a mushroom. Okay. And it sits in there and that digests the sugar right. and it ferments the whole thing. It sits on top and it grows. Right. It's an organism. Right. It looks like kind of a a uh, scene enemy. And then you use that in the next one. So we take it and put it in the next one. Next one. Okay. It lives forever. It grows right. and gets bigger. In fact, we break them in half and make them duplicates each of each other. Right. We start out with two, now we got 500. Right. 